broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome everyone into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology and everyone welcome into the program. I hope that you're doing well and you are ready for today's show because hey we have a very very fun one for you. We have of course Ralph Bond and he joins us. He is our science and tech trends correspondent and what exactly that means well you're going to pick up on that pretty fast. He's going to talk about Really, everything technology has a role in. And, uh, you know, not only that, they're going to be good stories, uplifting stories. Um, You know, I I don't know if anyone out there has uh, gotten a little, I don't know, fed up with the news. It's, uh, It's always pretty Debbie Downer. I mean, just this morning I was reading about how, like, the head of whatever organization is supposed to be leading climate change discussions uh, is trying to push their, you know... um, trying to push their oil reserves on other countries. And it's like, well, you know, things aren't going exactly as planned. But you know what is? Ralph's segment where he brings us uplifting good news. You know, we could talk about the bad stuff later. This is going to be the good stuff. And probably stories that you haven't heard of. Because not only sometimes are they kind of cutting edge research uh, focused, but they are also, you know, uh, just things that tend to fly under the radar. So joining us here in just a moment is, of course, Ralph Bond. Now, before we get to that, ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find everything, including past shows, future shows, show notes, articles, uh, all the recordings. Of course, you can find us wherever podcasts are heard. And then, of course, you can find us on social media. Check those out as well. Give us a like. Give us a follow. Really helps out. And we appreciate you. So with, uh, with that being said, I think we just go ahead and jump right into our segment with Ralph here. And, you know, he's a longtime contributor. You may know him from years and years ago as uh, the voice of the Intel Digital Minute, if you remember that far back. But of course, he has now evolved into our science and tech trends correspondent, where he, of course, discusses all of the fun stuff. So Ralph, welcome back onto the program. How you been? I'm doing great. It's great to be back. And boy, you're right after a Ah, very mixed bag week of news in the real world. We are going to give you some really great uplifting stuff. So what Ben and I do, and by the way, if you're new to the show, if you're first time listener or first time viewer, welcome. And so here's what, here's what we do. Ben and I each Friday highlight four recent articles that show us key trends and developments in artificial intelligence, robotics, medical technology, sustainable energy technology, transportation advances, agricultural tech, space research, physics, you name it. And as Ben was alluding to, most important of all, we're going to give you an oasis of positive news thanks to the world of science and technology. Absolutely. And, you know, um, of course, for those out there who are watching this, not just listening to this, uh, thank you. But uh, you can see up here on the screen, we're going to be following along. We'll show videos and different articles and different sources that Ralph has. But if you miss out on any of that, Check out the show notes. Ralph puts a lot of work into these. And of course, you can find them uh, at our website with links to any of these stories if you want to find out more. Uh, Ralph does a great job of summarizing, but hey, a summary doesn't get everything. Uh, So with that being said, Ralph, why don't we go ahead and just start with story number one? Yeah, story number one. And boy, people in Asheville, where you are from, can relate to the after effects of Hurricane Helene and the problems with water. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is kind of uh, something I'm sure you and your friends can relate to. So the headline here is researchers devise a unique upcycling use for old tires, producing drinking water. What? Old tires? How does that relate at all to producing drinking water? You're going to find out. This comes from Anthropocene Magazine. This is a really fun article. In the show notes at ComputerAmerica.com, as Ben was saying, I add additional links also. And I also add additional tutorial materials to each one of these little article snapshots. 
So let's get into the story here. Oh, before we do, first, I want mm-hmm. to explain that what we're talking about is a solar still, and we'll get into what that is. And I want you to, if you're listening to us as a podcast, again, please come out to computeramerica.com, get the show notes, you'll see the pictures. But for those who aren't going to do that, and just listening to us, let me describe what this device is. I want you to picture in your mind a body of water, in this case, the harbor of Halifax, Nova Scotia, and floating in the water is kind of a black sheet. And on top of the black sheet is, frankly, it's a clear see-through umbrella. So it's this like dome little structure. So this is all going to make sense in just a few minutes. Let's get into the story here. First, a quick reminder about the problem of discarded tires. So about 4 billion tires sit in landfills and junkyards around the world. From there, they leach many harmful chemicals and small microplastic pieces into the environment. So finding a way to recycle old tires is on many a scientist's agenda these days, as you can imagine. Now, researchers at Dalhousie University in Canada, and by the way, that's in Halifax, Nova Scotia, have turned old tires into a material that produces clean water from salt water by harnessing solar energy. Their new floating device can purify over 3.5 liters of water a day. That's just under a gallon. And what's more, it also generates a small amount of electricity. This is so clever. Hmm. And you're, again, you might be going, wait a minute, what, what, tires? What does this have to do with tires? Stand by, you'll we'll find out. The low-cost device is a version of the well-known solar still. These devices use solar energy to evaporate water, which separates out the salt and impurities. The water vapor is condensed on a cold surface and then collected as pure water. So that's what a classic solar still is. This is an innovative new version of that idea. So the Dahl Housey researchers made a floating solar still from a piece, actually a flat sheet, of foam. And then to keep costs low, they made the key ingredient of their solar still from discarded tires. So bear with me. This is a little little convoluted, a little detailed here, but bear with us. They ground the tires into crumbs, which they heated to 500 degrees Celsius in the absence of oxygen. By the way, that's about 932 degrees Fahrenheit. That process, by the way, converts the tire crumbs into a char made of fine carbon particles. Next, the team mixed the char with titanium dioxide powder and processed it to make tiny titanium carbide nanoparticles. And these particles are excellent at absorbing sunlight and turning it into heat. Ding! That's the thing to keep in mind. These particles are excellent at absorbing sunlight and turning it into heat. Huh. Wow. Previous, yeah, pretty, pretty crazy, Ben. Yeah, it, and who knew burning tires was the answer to uh, to all of our problems. That was uh, <laughs> yeah. I didn't see it coming. Well, you You're right. You don't want to burn tires, as you know, in a normal situation. Because yeah, no, they the do. A, they do especially. The but yeah. creates a pretty toxic bloom. But these guys did it in the absence of oxygen, and of course, in a controlled laboratory environment. Right. <laughs> right. But, but here's a, a little side note that's fun in the article. Previously, the team had studied various types of carbon waste, such as coffee grounds and lobster shells. Well, to make the nanoparticles, but they found that the tire rubber works best. Kind of interesting there. The researchers then coated the foam sheets with the tire-derived material. Finally, they covered the foam sheets with a see-through plastic dome to make their solar still, which if you look carefully at the photographs in the show notes, folks, it's kind of comical. They just took a see-through umbrella (laughs) <laughs> yeah it, and the, and, and i guess to yeah yeah and i guess to keep with the uh the low cost i mean like it, it looks like something that uh some very <laughs> you know uh ingenious redneck engineering but that's yes. kind of the point is, is to you know keep the cost low things that are already existing and come out with a working prototype so exactly exactly no it is it's extremely clever when they place the device which looks like a black sheet with a clear plastic dome again the umbrella on salty water so when they place this contraption on salty water the water wicked into the foam like a sponge and the solar heat generated by the coating of tiny titanium carbide nanoparticles created using the recycled tire char that whole combination caused the salt water to evaporate as the water vapor rises and condenses on the inside 
of the dome, again, the clear plastic umbrella, the now fresh water then flows down the sides into a bag for collection. Huh. Yeah, you so can see collection. the, uh, for, for those who are looking at the picture, you can see the hose kind of coming out of the front bottom left of yes. the uh, device here into a, another floating bag that I'm assuming yeah. they, they can come by and just swap out and, you know, keep it going. It's it's insanely simple, but insanely clever. I, mm -hmm. I just love this story. So going on here, it says, uh, it says, the research team noted that, quote, most floating solar desalination research has been done only in controlled lab environments with real world studies remaining scarce. So with this in mind, the research team decided to take their device out into the field, out into the real world. They placed the floating device on the Atlantic Ocean off the Halifax Harbor for five full days. The device converted solar energy to water vapor with an efficiency of 40% at a calculated rate of 3.67 liters for each square meter. 3 mm. 7, or 3.67 liters for each square meter each day. And that, folks, is just a whisper below one gallon. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's roughly one and a half times the amount of water an average person needs each day. So scaling up to serve a community could involve making larger stills or floating a whole fleet of these little devices. Huh. The researchers say that they could also modify the device to produce a small amount of electricity using a phenomenon called the thermoelectric effect. The electricity should be enough to power small water quality sensors. Hmm. And next summer, the researchers plan to test the device further in South Asia. And when I first read that, I thought, well, gosh, you're in northern Canada. Why would you go to South? Maybe because <laughs> they want to go to a humid, hot climate and try it out and see how much more water could be generated. I'm just speculating. And that by the or, way, in the show notes, mm -hmm. if you're interested in thermal electric effect, I have a little tutorial insert there for you to check out. But pretty darn clever stuff. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and I imagine, you know, like right now they're doing it in, you know, real world conditions with, you know, uh, the harbor and uh, doing all that yeah. good stuff. But, you know, I guess they want to, assuming everything goes well, hey, why not put it in even more real world conditions where, where you know, you don't have just the scientists using them. Maybe they're going to give them out to people to, you know, try themselves and, you yes. know, see how it does and iterate upon that. But still, yeah. hey, uh, I can only imagine that it's uh, much more needed in South Asia than it is in uh, a harbor in Canada. So, yeah. Yeah, there you well, go. good point. <laughs> yep. So there you go. Uh, story number one, very cool. And again, the the picture shows so much, but yet not really a lot of the science going on behind it. So right, hey, right. that's where the article comes in. So that's great. Story number one, story number two, we're going to go ahead and skip down and we're going to talk about, you know, uh, there's been so much talk about uh the role of trees and you know that kind of mm -hmm. thing and it's like you know there's also discussion about uh you know what kind of trees how old are the trees old growth new growth pine trees versus oak trees versus blah blah blah, blah. like you know the trees aren't going to solve everything i think we've kind of proven that uh they're gonna they're definitely gonna play a key role but they're not gonna solve everything even trees could use a little bit of a bump a little bit of a boost yes. um and some help so that's where i think humans need to get a little bit more creative and story number two kind of speaks to that and you know instead of just I'm not saying trees are lazy they're 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 good trees <laughs> but um you know what if we could get the benefits of a tree without having to you know kind of I guess, wait as long as a tree. So we'll see. Yeah, uh, story yeah. number two, Ralph, and uh, CO2. Yes, exactly right. So again, what Ben is alluding to, of course, we all know the role that trees play in absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and helping with our challenge of climate change and so on. So this story relates directly to that. It comes from the Los Angeles Times. The headline here, half a pound of this powder can remove as much CO2 from the air as a tree, scientists say. Huh, this is, I love this story. A typical large tree can suck as much as 40 kilograms of carbon dioxide out of the air over the course of a year. So there's your, your measure. Now, scientists at UC Berkeley, of course, that's in California, say that they can do the same job with less than half a pound of a fluffy yellow powder they've developed. Hmm, the powder was designed to trap the greenhouse gas in its microscopic pores then release it when it's ready to be squirreled away someplace where it can't contribute to global warming. And as you hmm. know, it's mostly 
people shoot the uh, carbon dioxide down deep into the ground. That's one way to get it out of the way. Yeah. And here's a quote. It performs beautifully, said Omar Yagi, a chemist at UC Berkeley and the study's senior author. He goes on to say, based on the stability and the behavior of the material right now, we think it will go through thousands of cycles. And we'll explain that comment in just a moment. This is so fun. Dubbed, I love this, dubbed COF-999. <laughs> The powder can Catchy. be deployed in the kinds of large-scale direct air capture plants that are starting to come online to reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And Ben, as you and I have talked about over the past couple of years, there's all these technologies to pull carbon dioxide out of the air and then eventually store it, typically speaking, underground. So this is a, a new example of that technology. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and... I, and yeah, go oh, ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say that, you know, of, of all the technology that we've talked about, yeah. uh, it, it does seem like the one making, you know, at least as far as green energy goes, uh, well, not green energy, but uh, our efforts to help the environment, uh, right. there is a lot of different approaches. You know, we, we had yes. one a couple of months or even maybe like a year or two ago now where they were going to set up these giant turbines in, in the, you know, in the middle of the Midwest and have these giant, essentially think of like air filters for your, you know, for your air conditioner or something like that. And just yeah. catching the carbon that kind of passes through and they yeah. were going to try to pump it out that way. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, it's uh, a lot of different approaches. Yeah, and this whole idea of a powder is completely different than any other carbon capture technology you and I have talked about or that I've been mm -hmm. aware of. So this is really kind of a cool story. Going on with the story, though, when viewed under a scanning electron microscope, the yellow powder resembles tiny basketballs with billions of holes. Hmm. The structures are held together by some of the strongest chemical bonds in nature, including the ones that turn carbon atoms into diamonds. This, this is very geeky stuff, way above my brain level. <laughs> Attached to the scaffolds are compounds called amines. And in the show notes, I've inserted a little tutorial on what amines are, if you want to geek out on that. But going on here, it says, so when air flows through the structures of this yellow powder, most of the, com uh, pardon me, most of the components pass by undisturbed. But the amines grab onto the carbon dioxide, which is acidic those CO2 molecules will stay put in the powder until scientists loosen them up by applying heat. Then they can vacuum the CO2 molecules up for safekeeping, most likely by pumping them deep underground, as we mentioned before. Once the carbon dioxide is removed from the powder, the entire process can begin again. In fact, in tests, the experimental yellow powder material was still in fine form after 100 such cycles of absorbing heating releasing st storing absorbing heating releasing they were able to do this a hundred times and the powder was still good so that suggests the practicality of this material in large-scale plants so kind of uh just a, such a different twist on the whole idea of capturing carbon dioxide out of the air i i'm i'm curious and, and you know i i am famously not good with chemistry i i skipped that <laughs> whole section of my life uh but i do kind of wonder what gives it that yellow kind of tint it, it, it's such a yeah. vibrant pigment of yellow um it's, it's cheerful <laughs> yeah 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 it's certainly cheerful um and yeah i'm curious why um you know why it's that color but also i mean uh, durability and you know the ability to reuse it like you said 100 cycles and uh yeah. and i believe the scientist said that it could last thousands of cycles yes. um potentially that um yeah you know that that's that's a huge viability test you know how 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 good is it because you know ralph sometimes we talk about technology that's you know oh if only the entire infrastructure were different we could easily do this and it's like yeah. you know eh, th this is something that seems like it has a lot of uh it has a lot of positives and hey could maybe even one day kind of help us like I, I don't know it's technology like that that really makes our segments a lot of fun ralph because you know if we can just figure out this whole environment thing as 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 uh, as yeah. messy and complex as it is um if we could just you know give ourselves a little bit of room a little bit of boost and you know get some good news that isn't you know we miss key target we we you know we're not going to meet these deadlines we're not going to do this like oh, if we can gosh, just turn yeah. that down a little bit and just give ourselves some more time 
stories like this kind of give me hope that that's going to be possible. You know, they're yes. they're working on real solutions that hey, that could work. So yeah, there you and, go. And also, also Ben, this story reminds me of something that I get on a soapbox and say over and over and over again. It's not one technology that's going to fight and solve climate change. It could be part of a, a, a constellation of technologies that we've talked about, all mm-hmm. combining together and cleverly going after this problem in multiple ways. So it's nobody is saying this yellow powder is the answer. <laughs> it's one of the components of an answer. <laughs> exactly. So, so that's story number two. If you're following along, story number three, we're going to go ahead and move on over to cars. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, uh, new car technology, always fun. And this one is, um, I'll admit, something I have never heard of. Uh, I have heard of Hyundai. Mm-hmm. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, mm-hmm. But I have not heard of this new concept car that they have uh, potentially around the corner. So, yeah. Ralph, let's talk about EVs. Yeah, this is a great one. So a key trend, Ben, the past couple of years you and I've been talking about has been the growing interest in hydrogen-powered vehicles. That's what we're talking about here. Here's the headline. Hyundai Initium, that's I-N-I-T-I-U-M, Hyundai Initium hydrogen concept car shows where design is headed next. In the subhead here, it's powered by a hydrogen fuel cell that provides a maximum range of 404 miles. And again, friends, remember that the attraction of hydrogen-powered vehicles is the exhaust is water vapor. That's it. (laughs) That's not going to hurt the environment. This comes from a really cool publication called Mm InsideEVs.com. Mm-hmm. And here we go. So Hyundai's new close-to-production concept called the Initium will be unveiled at the 2024 Los Angeles Auto Show running from November 22nd through December the 1st. So this is just around the corner. Powering the concept is a hydrogen fuel cell system that runs a 201 horsepower motor, and it gives the Initium a claimed range of 404 miles. So for the rest of the world, that's 650 kilometers on one tank. That's more than its predecessor. By the way, Hyundai's had a previous hydrogen vehicle called the Nexio, which could only manage 378 miles or 609 kilometers and had 40 horsepower less. So this is a big jump yeah, it's good improvement and power. Yep. And Hyundai intends to produce the Initium starting in 2025. So we're not talking about deep future here. We're talking about just around the corner. And just like its hydrogen fuel cell predecessors, which only sold a couple of thousand cars a year globally at best, and most of them in South Korea, the Initium won't be an important model for Hyundai on the world stage. And I added my own comment. What I think the author's saying is, from a revenue point of view, it's important, however, on another front, and that's where the article kind of wraps up. It says, but it will be important from a technology perspective. Hyundai, along with a few other automakers, in my opinion, most notably Toshiba, or pardon me, uh, Toyota, aren't giving up on hydrogen fuel cells, even as they invest vastly more resources into battery EVs. But believe me, this whole interest in hydrogen vehicles is not going away. Toyota, as I mentioned before, is really keen on these cartridges, these hydrogen cartridges. So they have a vision of the future where you drive into a filling station and onto one side might be a place where you can pull out a cylindrical cartridge, pop it into your car and go on your merry way. So very, very interesting thing. And again, key trend, hydrogen vehicles. Yeah, they're and and we've seen the technology being more adopted for things like buses and, you know, yeah. larger, larger scale vehicles. But right. to scale it down into, you know, kind of the personal vehicles. Yeah, that, of course, is, is something that is going to happen. Ralph, I, I think there's a reason that, you know, when you look at electric cars, not in, you know, there are electric SUVs by now. But sure. when you look at like electric cars, this hydrogen concept car is a bit more, you know, kind of bigger and bulkier and heavier. Uh, it's because the fuel kind of allows for that. You know, it's uh, it's going to have the range and it's going to have the fuel yeah. that you can have. Um, yeah, it, it just like you said, last story, it's not going to be one of, you know, it's not going to be one thing that solves everything And hydrogen definitely serves a purpose and we're going to see it more and more and more. So, yeah. Uh, even though the own article said, you know, it's not going to be that big of a deal on the world stage, 
Um, no, it is. It, it it's any time that you can put that technology into people's garages. Yeah. Um, that is a good start. So yeah, there you go. yeah. And Ben, as you and I've talked about in the past, the whole issue with hydrogen powered vehicles is distribution of we'll call it the fuel. Okay, the hydrogen fuel cells. How do you get this in a practical, smooth way? Of course, the infrastructure for uh, petroleum or gasoline is so well established, of course, right? Mm -hmm. And we're trying so hard with charging stations for all EV uh, electrical vehicles, but that still remains a big challenge. And this, the big barrier to EV adoption is range anxiety. Mm -hmm. So you have to overcome a very, very significant infrastructure challenge in order to make hydrogen fuel cell vehicles a practical thing. Granted, but it is research it's going on and this is a real world delivery albeit maybe only a few thousand vehicles sold a year but it's a trend to watch it it it, it has that key thing going for it that a lot of fuel just doesn't have which is um you know it's hydrogen it, it's not that exotic of a fuel it is hard to right. kind of keep contained but also it's not it's not environmentally damaging it's not uh something that you really need to be uh, concerned about if there's a leak of it like you don't want to leak because you want the fuel but still um ralph like this is going to play as years and years and years go by um this is going to play a bigger and bigger role uh yeah. is it sustainable and this 100 percent is um yes. yeah we just have to get it there so it has a lot going for it we'll see what happens but good on uh, good on hyundai for you know really you know uh Getting it going. So there you go. Okay. Story yeah. number three. Story number four. Let's go ahead and hop on down and talk about bioprinters. Uh, you know, uh, yes. story number four, like you always like to mention, is uh, usually reserved for medical technology. Uh, Ralph owes a lot. And really, you know, even uh, <laughs> the, the ability for my wife to walk, you know, uh, due, yes. due to a recent car accident. Like, you know, medical technology, very incredibly helpful. It's, yes, um, yes. you know, uh, we owe a lot to it. Uh, a lot of people owe a lot to it. And one area of medicine, uh, you know, uh, there's so many that I like that you kind of bring to us on the show, but one of them that just overlaps with technology so nicely is the idea of a 3D printer. Um, yes. You know, those are still, you know, a fun topic in technology alone, but something called a bioprinter is uh, coming up more and more in your stories, which I absolutely love. So story number Me four. Me too. Yeah, yeah, me too. I'm I'm 100% with you on that. Bioprinting in the medical field and elsewhere is just so interesting. This story comes from an outlet called theengineer.co.uk, so from our friends in the United Kingdom. The headline here, bioprinter rapidly mimics tissues from brain to bone subhead. Researchers at the University of Melbourne have developed a new 3D bioprinting technique that can rapidly create accurate analogs of virtually any human tissue. Wow. I mean, that just takes my breath away. So let's get into the story. This is really, really cool stuff. And it, if this doesn't leave you feeling better about where we're headed as human beings, mm -hmm. I give up. This is great. Where most of today's bioprinters rely on time-consuming layer-by-layer fabrication, this new breakthrough platform uses an optical-based system where vibrating bubbles 3D print cellular structures in seconds. This is extremely geeky stuff, folks. You need to get into the full article, and you can dig as deep as you want. We're going to just give you the greatest hits of this article, okay? The technique is claimed to be, get ready for this, this technique is claimed to be 350 times faster than existing bioprinters, as well as enabling more accurate cell positioning for better replication of human tissues. The cell positioning you'll understand here in a moment. According to the University of Melbourne team, the device can mimic everything from soft brain tissue to tougher substances, such as cartilage and bone. This accuracy combined with the platform's speed could be a major advance for areas including cancer research and drug development, in addition to creating uh, replacement tissues, right? Wow. <sighs> the University of Melbourne's associate professor, David Collins, noted, quote, 
In addition to drastically improving print speed, our approach enables a degree of cell positioning with, within printed tissue. So the huh. cell positioning is a big deal. He goes on to say, incorrect cell positioning is a big reason most 3D bioprinters fail to produce structures that accurately represent human tissue. And I love this next part of his quote. Just as a car requ requires its mechanical components to be arranged precisely for proper function, so too must the cells in our tissues be organized correctly. Current 3D bioprinters, he goes on to say, depend on cells aligning naturally without guidance, which presents significant limitations. He then says, our system, on the other hand, uses acoustic waves generated by vibrating bubble to position cells within 3D printed structures. What? <laughs> he says then, this method provides the necessary head start for cells to develop into the complex tissues found in the human body. I rest my case. This is just great stuff, Ben. Yeah, I, 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 you know, even though we have talked so much about, you know, bioprinters and things like that, um, and we talk about it for like skin grafts and, and bone grafts mm -hmm. and whatnot, um, you know, it's kind of weird. No one's really brought up this idea. Maybe because they just didn't have a perfect answer for it. No one's brought up this idea of cell positioning. You know, they were just like, oh, we print a skin graft and the body's going to do with it what it does. And, you know, it's all going to work out in the end. Uh, very interesting. I, I, I'd never heard about that aspect of it. Yeah. 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 It's And this whole bit about a vibrating, vibrating bubble to position mm -hmm. the cells is like, what? <laughs> you know, there's a great story there and it's we just don't yeah. have time to dig into it. <laughs> for sure. So, and then yeah. to wrap things up, by the way, Ben, mm -hmm. it says, according to the Melbourne team, the technology is already making waves within the medical community. No surprise there. <laughs> yeah, I, it, whoever, whatever research team, and there are probably hundreds of research teams around the world working on this kind of thing, uh, whoever figures out how to print, you know, uh, uh, skin tissue, organs that can work, and, and organs are, are, are really a big one, you know, just something that... Uh, Ralph, that, you know, if you, let's say, needed um, a transplant from a kidney donor, liver donor, something like that, how cool would it be, Ralph, if instead they just take a little bit of your healthy liver, print, 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 and just make you a good enough human liver to transplant directly into you, that is your cells, your body, won't, hopefully won't reject it. Um, that's kind of the dream. And, you know, I yeah. think about how many lives would be saved and, and yeah. improved um, if we could just give people the organs that they need, you know, they have to wait for someone yep. to, you know, kind of donate. Yep. So, yeah, so there you go. Very it's cool technology. Stuff. Yeah. Very cool technology. And it is getting developed all the time. So ladies and gentlemen, that is a great point to kind of say, well, that's about it. But for everyone else out there who is following along, you see the section called honorable mentions. And these are not worse. They are not less. If you are any researcher who is, uh, you know, listening to our segment and being like, oh, we only made the honorable mentions. Uh, don't worry. <laughs> you are doing good work. It's just we try to keep the show compact, you know, closer to a more bite sized format, which Ralph is great at. And then <laughs> we, uh, yeah, we have the honorable mentions because Ralph doesn't just find four stories. Like we didn't limit the number because we're like ralph there's only on average there's only four good things that happen in a week no, uh, right <laughs> no not the case ladies and gentlemen and if you want to have more good uplifting news go ahead and check out the honorable mentions so ralph we can at least give the nice folks uh the headlines and they can head on over to computeramerica.com go to the bottom of the show notes and find these uh links if you want to know more so yeah, exactly. So we'll give you the titles and the source, and then you can get to the show notes and dig deeper if you so desire. First one comes from Phys, P-H-Y-S, which is short for physics, dot O-R-G. Headline, sustainable hydrophobic cellulose shows potential for replacing petroleum-related products such as packaging and biomedical devices. So there's so much research, Ben, as you well know in finding alternatives to petroleum-based plastic. And we will get there. And this mm -hmm. is just another example of one of the many efforts worldwide to do this. So great article, check it out. And by the way, fizz.org is a wonderful outlet. Next one comes from electrek, E-L-E-C-T-R-E-K.com. And Amprius ships EV battery that reaches 90% charge in 15 minutes. Another trend example to our trends theme 
about this incredible effort worldwide to make charging faster, which would be part of the equation of overcoming range anxiety. Of course, mm -hmm. if you've got an EV vehicle, you run out of uh, your battery juice and you have to sit there for five hours to charge. No, that's yeah. not going to work if you're on the road traveling from one state to another. So this is a good example of that kind of effort to make charging faster. Now, in this case, these batteries are for smaller devices like drones and so forth, but the implication can be applied to larger vehicles as well. Mm -hmm. And the next one, this is fun from Flying Magazine, headline Airbus, developing technology to control fighter jets with the wave of a hand gesture control of a fighter jet. Wow. Now I can see Tom Cruise, you know, not only having to do it, but <laughs> flinging his hands around. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> was that Minority Top Report Gun. or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's Mixing a cool Minority story. Report and Top Gun together. Exactly. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And our last honorable mention this week is headline. And this, by the way, this article offers a great brief on the growing creation of sodium-based batteries, noting work being done in the United States. So the headline here is lithium-ion batteries have ruled for decades. Now they have a challenger. And that's a reference to sodium-based batteries. And you want to talk about a, uh, an ingredient that's pretty common? Sodium. <laughs> instead of lithium. Anyway, it comes from the Washington Post. It's a very, very good roundup of where we're at with the development of sodium-based batteries. Great stuff, folks. Check it out. Show notes, computeramerica.com. Absolutely. So with that being said, Ralph, I think we uh, are going to call it there. And let's see. There we go. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for tuning into the show and joining us. Ralph, these were all great stories. And, you know, uh, there is reason to be hopeful for technology. Like it, it, it doesn't really matter what else happens on Earth. You know, natural disasters doesn't matter about you know what happens in these countries. Like there are still scientists, you know, working day in and day out to try to find new new solutions to our common problems. So yeah, very helpful, Ralph. You've done a good job. I feel uplifted. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you feel uplifted out there. And if you want to, you know, get some more uplifting stuff, check out our past shows with Ralph. We of course have them labeled so it's easy. And of course you can find them on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, you can see all of our past shows. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning into Computer America. Ralph, thank you for joining us. Everyone, catch you here next time. Have a good one. Have a good weekend. Bye everyone.